this is so humiliating. <laughs> hi, I'm Lance. Say hi, I'm Lance, or... And I'm Mike. And I'm Mike! <laughs> and we are just, just these, these guys, guys, you know? <laughs> what is going on? That is a caramel cappuccino. Goodness. With a little cinnamon. Well, let's here we go. Man. Talk about wishing you could control the past. <laughs> if I'd have just said something. I know. That's uh, ask and you shall receive. <laughs> yeah, exactly. The, well, I guess one of these days I might actually learn. Well, and that is what this mm -hmm. is designed to help you learn to do. So what are we going to yep. start doing with these next series of podcasts? Well, we are going to begin to walk through four fundamentals that Dr. Parker has been teaching for a long time, and he was inspired to put it in a book, and it's called 12-2, and... Knowing we were going to do this, I've obviously been going back through the book, <laughs> and I'm telling you right now, it is absolutely, um, the Bible is life-changing, this is life-altering. Fantastic. And yeah. What I want the audience to know is Mike brought his book in, and the biggest compliment somebody can give an author is this book is mangled. Yeah. It is, it is wrinkled. Dog pages are dog-eared, things are highlighted, mm -hmm. notes are written in the margin, and and that just uh, you know warms my heart that you're actually digging into that and and working on it. Yeah, and admittedly so, the very first thing that I did this morning when I woke up was I completely violated fundamental number one, <laughs> <laughs> which is you know it's just a habit of of the way, but. Here's the thing, the most important um, kind of revelation that I have had of recent um, times where I've been in the book is um, that I don't have to expect that to always be the case. Right. That I can absolutely change the way I think about what I think about this. Exactly. And today we'll, we'll kind of talk about the introduction to the book because the, the, uh, the intro and I don't know if we'll get to cognitive restructuring yet, but, but these two things kind of set you up to understand what your challenge is to try to do right. with the four fundamentals. Yep. Now, they're fundamentals. They're, they're the basics. These things underlie everything. So once you get the four fundamentals down, then you're ready to take the advanced steps. Mm-hmm. And so like over the last six years, if you had the four fundamentals down, it would have made perfect sense and you would have felt super comfortable to ask <laughs> right. for what you want. Sure. And that's, you know, what the fundamentals are designed to do is to reposition your brain, is to transform how you think to empower you to pursue the things that you want in your life. Yep. And obviously... Um, for a Christian, uh, what the most fundamental thing we want is to know his will for us. Yeah, absolutely. And, and when that settles in, then we can actually seek to know. Yep. But up until this transformation in thinking occurs, we're trying to figure out what it is. But all the while, he's sitting there going, if you just ask me, yep, <laughs> I, I might be able to you know, shed some light on the subject. It's right there under the closed cover of a book that is piling up dust for so many of us. Um, well, as an example, this morning, Coco, when she got to our house, one of the very first things, what she does is she gets her little area set up in the living room she'll right. get this certain pillow out this certain blanket out she's got this bag of balls that she gets out yeah and then she walked over to the chair and she looked up at her bottle and she just pointed at it and she all she made was a noise uh. <laughs> and i knew exactly what she wanted right we're really good at it when we're we're starting out mm -hmm. and then we kind of lose 
track of understanding the power that we have to be able to live in that kind of oh you know, my world. It becomes so complex. Sure. We make it. Yeah. So in, 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 in worldly terms, we call that drama. Yep. We, we create so much drama in our lives yep. because of how we think. Yep. Well, for those of you who are listening, and uh, next week you'll be able to see I'm wearing a, a shirt today. That is Mr. Albert Einstein's face and kind of Lance's hair. Oh. <laughs> and But the idea behind this, in, in my very simpleton way of thinking, that, that you know Albert Einstein had the theory of relativity. This is the theory of relatability. Oh, the, uh, well, that's pretty good, isn't it? Yeah, I'm going to quote that. Yes, and so this is improving our ability to relate to God and to others. Yes. And to ourselves, by the way. Yes. So I'm going to yes. give this to you, and, well, and I'm here to no, it's, it's learn about, with everybody else. It's not about I'm going to um, – I got a question for you. Okay. Uh, you're enjoying that cup of coffee right now. I am. And if you got to the bottom and saw a big uh, goop of cat hair and phlegm, <laughs> how might you feel? I would immediately regret the past. <laughs> <laughs> That's what Not you would good. think. <laughs> Not good. How would you feel? Yeah, I would be a little. Um, would you be nauseated? I would be a little nauseated. You're, you're yes. holding your tongue. Hair is not something that I enjoy um, in my coffee. Yeah, have you ever been eating like a little Jello cup and pull out a big scoop of hair? Oh, I have a story where throat. I had, yeah, I had gone to Subway and gotten Don and I a sandwich, and uh, the uh, young lady. It was a young lady behind the, the counter making the sandwiches, long blonde hair. Got home, the very first bite that I took out of my sandwich, <laughs> after I chewed it and swallowed it, I felt there was a hair. I grabbed a hold of it, and my arm wasn't long enough oh my to goodness. pull the hair out of your throat. Of my throat. Your stomach, your throat. And I immediately, here's, here's how I respond. <laughs> I immediately punched the sandwich <laughs> Smashed it into the table because I just hair. <laughs> I don't do well with hair, so it's funny that you say that. <laughs> yeah, that's well, that's how I would feel. Well, right now, there goes that bracelet again. Yep. Right now, people, there are some people out there who are turning off the podcast. <laughs> they're, they're grabbing their chest. They're they're getting ready to throw up as we talk about this. Sure. And that is part of the introduction here yeah okay. is the power of the mind right that we can think about something gross and have a physiological reaction to the thought it's so true I mean, if you think about something gross and then you find yourself dry heaving the cat hair isn't here the the long hair from subway is not in your mouth right now mm -hmm. but as you think about it, you start to have this physiological reaction. Yeah, my saliva glands are working overtime right now. <laughs> and for the people we haven't lost yet, right? that is the power of thinking. Sure. That we can have this thought, and that's all it is, is a thought, and then have this physiological reaction. So if a thought can change your body's function in an instant, mm. imagine what it's doing to your emotional state you bet your your motivation your 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 stress yep. your anxiety yep. the, the thought is so powerful that it actually can and does regulate all of our emotional mental physiological functioning yeah it has control that and because the thought has that kind of power that's why we as a psychologist or cognitive behavioral psychologist, and we'll get to that more later, mm -hmm. but that's why we focus so much on thinking is because that is the keystone, the cornerstone that, that controls everything. And so learning to change how you think, and that was something, uh, if you remember in the introduction, I, I kind of shout out to you about it because um, that was a, a really powerful moment for me. You know, I, I began attending your church and I'm walking in and y'all are playing ACDC and <laughs> yeah, um, Tesla. Freaks a lot of people out. Yeah. But 
you know, there was part of me, I'm kind of going back and forth, like, I love this music, but is it a, does it belong in a church? And I, I started, you know, I dig into you. I'm like, okay, well, he's playing this song for a reason. Let me listen to the song and see why he would choose to play a secular song in a church setting. Sure. And as I listen to the words of the song, I realize that, that there's a double meaning here. Yep. You know, uh, Jesus is just all right with me by the Doobie Brothers. When I'm listening to it on the radio in the car, I, I kind of go one place with it. But when I'm sitting in church, I'm praising Jesus. Yeah. You know, and so I, I got it without having to be told. Yeah. But where that real power came in is I was driving around one day and I heard this song by ACDC, If You Want Blood, You Got It. And, you know, up until this moment in time, in my mind, ACDC has been this devil worshiping music you know, right. back in the 80s and yeah. all that nonsense that went on. Feel guilty about listening to it. Exactly. Yeah. But as I listened to the words of that song, that moment. I envision Jesus singing to me. Mm -hmm. And when I saw those words coming out of Jesus's mouth, the entire song changed. Mm -hmm. yep. um, you know, if you want blood, you got it. Yeah. You know, blood on the streets, blood on the rocks, blood in the gutter, every last drop. And that is exactly what God and Jesus did for us. That's right. In order to save all of us, the entire world, in order to free us from the dominion of sin, mm -hmm. to overcome the law, to end the tyranny of the law, to yep. free us from sin forever, he spilt every last drop of blood. Mm. And, and, you know, when I see Jesus saying those words to me, Lance, if you want blood, you got it. And, and, you know, you watch the passion movies and they're dragging them through the street and blood's on everything. And, and I'm like, wow, you know, my change in perspective about the song changed my entire emotional state about how I felt when I heard the song. Yeah. It took ACDC to BCAD for you. <laughs> took it to all about Jesus. And so, you know, as a, I don't want to get ahead in the book too much. I, I didn't read it. Sure. <laughs> I know you read it before you walked in here. You just wrote it. That's all I did. But um, as a cognitive behavioral psychologist, mm -hmm. you know, what we're talking about is we see people as being comprised of three elements, cognitions, which are thoughts, behaviors, which are what you do. Yep. Um, and doing can be the words that you speak. And if you get you know, highly technical with some psychologists, there are actually, you can kind of lump some attitudinal shifts as a behavior, but essentially behavior is what you do. And then feelings. Okay. We are comprised of thoughts, yep. behaviors, and feelings. Yep. And they're all intertwined. Yep. You know, if you think this would be a great idea, then you're motivated uh, logically. This would be a great idea. This would save me a lot of money. So I do it because it makes sense. So my thinking impacts my behavior. If I think I don't want to do it. Yep then that thinking is going to impact my behavior. If I think this will save me a lot of money and that concept is exciting to me. Now my thought that I'll do this, it'll save me a lot of money. And if an emotion follows behind that and I get excited about it, mm -hmm. now my thoughts have impacted how I feel. My thoughts and my feelings now really drive and motivate me to do the behavior yep. and when I do the behavior I now think about what I just did and I may feel proud of myself and so what I think what I do what I feel they're all intertwined and they all work together and so in, in cognitive behavioral psychology we talk extensively about change how you think change what you experience yep you use the example if I'm remembering 
correctly of someone who's laying in bed in the morning and they decide that they're just not going to get up that they just, it's, it's going to be a bad day anyway. Right. And so they're laying there and then they go back to sleep and then they wake up a little later and they feel even worse. Right. Because what they thought affected their behavior is now affecting how they feel. And so we have the power right out of the gate to determine which direction we can go. And that's either like in, or first thing in the morning, you're always talking about go somewhere inspirational first thing in the morning in your mind. Go to uh, uh, like a podcast or go to uh, uh, inspirational video or, or something to listen to and feed your mind with positivity, not negativity. Even if that isn't necessarily the first thing that comes natural, do it anyway and begin to form that habit. And so, yeah, that's, it's amazing. It really is how, how those three are connected so strongly. Well, and, and you mentioned go somewhere in the morning. Um, and I, I don't know that all the audience out there is computer literate, but it's a perfect analogy for morning time. Mm -hmm. you know, when I turn on my computer, it, it takes a few minutes for it to get up and running to where I can start to do something. Sure what's happening is it's loading in certain programs in the background that are necessary to run the computer. Yep. And, and, and so before I ever start to think on the computer, it has loaded in the necessary program for me to be able to do that. Now, if one of those programs has a virus in it, yeah. Mm -hmm. if that one of those programs are faulty, when I turn on the computer, and the computer boots up and loads up and it starts running haywire. And I'm like, I can't do anything about that because I just turned it on and this is what it's doing. Yeah. And so for the, the, the technophobe out there, technophile out there, uh, you're a technophobe. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> for the technophile <laughs> out there, for people who love technology. Yep. When something like that happens you know, and you call into the tech support, they may tell you, Turn on the computer, but hit F11 a whole bunch mm -hmm. because you want to interrupt the boot up process gotcha. and, and load it up into a safe mode mm -hmm. so you can then see what's happening and prevent that virus infected program from loading up. And then once you get that virus and program out, then you can start over and everything loads up correctly. And that's exactly what happens us in the morning. Yeah. When, when we wake up, our brain starts booting up. Yep. And those first few thoughts in the first 30 seconds, minute, five minutes of the morning, they load up and they set your attitude for the rest of the morning, the rest of the day. Mm -hmm. And things can go off the rails real quick. That's why for years and years, uh, it's getting a little better, but that's only recently. Um, uh, I interrupted the boot up process by hitting the snooze button and then I would hit it again and I would hit it again. But really it's just because I didn't want to get my day started. Didn't want. Right. And so but I'm, I'm four, changing, for sure. I'm, ch I'm, I'm changing because I'm deciding to do it. I'm changing that behavior. Um, I, I didn't No, I did. I hit the snooze button one time this morning, but it's uncommon. It would be five, six, seven times before, which I look back on it and I think, what the heck was I thinking? <laughs> but what were you thinking? It was a, it, yeah, it was just, it was a <laughs> habit that I had allowed because but, it, I was in control, always have been, and I allowed it. And the, the habit comes from how you think. So when, yep. when the alarm goes off and you think, I don't feel good, I don't feel like getting up, I don't want to get up, those three thoughts. Here's the, here's the crazy thing. What is the computer language that your brain operates in? As it's processing data, operating, thinking, what is that computer language called that your brain uses? Memory. English language. <laughs> so right now. Are you talking? Okay. It, it, I was trying to come up with a computer language. I was like, what the heck? 
No, <laughs> and, and it's, you know, we have basic, we have COBOL, we have all these different computer languages. Mm -hmm. The computer language our brain uses is called English. Gotcha. And so if you're thinking, this guy's weird, well, what are you going to say later? That guy was weird. So the words going through your brain, the computer program, how you're thinking mm -hmm. is reflected in how you speak. Mm. And so that's when I, I kind of ping on you and, and I definitely ping on my clients. Mm -hmm. They get tired of me. <laughs> sure. But when I ping on you for a word, the word in and of itself is not a bad word, but there's a 90% chance that you're using that, that word is a clue to your perspective. Mm. So like, don't, I'm always yelling about don't. Yeah. Well, I don't have any coffee. Well, that's fine because that's a factual statement. Right. Th there is no coffee here. I don't have coffee. And if I mean it in the factual sense, then that's a fair use of the word because it's, it's a proper grammar and a proper thought. But if I say, I don't have any coffee and I begin to cry, well, I am now thinking in a negative fashion. I am thinking about what I don't have as opposed to what I do have. Mm -hmm. and, and so how I think negatively versus positively, it, it, the clues are all around us. It's learning to identify these perspectives and begin the challenge of catching the old perspective and instilling the new perspective. Stop thinking the old way, start thinking the new way. Is this sounding familiar? A little bit of transforming of the mind. Paul said, do not be conformed to the ways of this world. Yep. And so the ways of the world, he's, he's not referring to don't go to the bar. Right. You know, don't yell at your wife. The ways, you know, there's a, there's a grace point way of worshiping. Mm -hmm. You know, there's the American way. Mm -hmm. And when we say the American way, we're referring to a belief system, a set of values, principles, uh, what we find important and unimportant. All of that is the way. Yep. And so when Paul says, do not be conformed to the ways of this world, he is saying, don't think like this world be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So yeah. don't think the way the world thinks, learn to think differently. Yep. By the way, he's directing us towards the way, thinking like Jesus. Well, wasn't that the original Yep. Kind of name of Christianity yeah. was yeah, it the was. way. Yeah. That's what they called the followers of, of Jesus. They were a part of the way. Right. Yeah. And so, and the way yeah. is a that, new belief system. You bet. So that's for me, just on a very personal level, what makes this so uh I'm trying to come up with the best adjectives not to over uh, state it. It's just, this is so, it's connected really, really well to scripture. Take breaking it down to the basic four. If we can get on top of these four things, then it will change the way we perceive who Jesus is and what the word is telling us. And so to me, that's huge. And I think that's the, where the the calling was to, to write this was, I, I know this over here in my professional life, right. uh, that how we think leads to what we feel and, and leads to what we do. And you know, a connection that was made in there, because I told you it was kind of, all, kind of born out of chaos, but um, I did a video a couple of years ago where I extolled the power of uh, Creflo Dollar's Eight Steps to Change Your Life. Yeah. And in that video, uh, in his eight steps to change your life that I, I explained in the video, he, he talks about uh, our situation and circumstances. We always find ourselves in the same situations and circumstances over and over and over. And we, you know, how do we get out of this? We want to change our life. We want to change our circumstances. 
and there's an eight step walk to be able to do that. But right smack dab in the middle of those eight steps is how you think leads to what you experience leads to what you do. Mm. And, and there's steps before there's steps after, but that critical element right in the middle. Yeah. The meat, how you think leads to what you feel leads to what you do. Mm -hmm. And, and, and it, so it lays it out in nice format so you can see how we're living our lives. These three elements are stuck right in the middle of that. That's the controlling factor. And so how I think leads to what I experience. And I see so many people not having the experience in church that they want. And, and they're earnest and they're trying very hard yep. to, to generate that experience, but it's, it's always just kind of out of their reach, just on the other side. And if I do more, if I do more, if I study harder, if I pray harder, and, and it's not about what you do, it's about how you perceive. Yep. It's not about changing the experience itself it's about changing your perspective of the experience and what god wants for you and in it when when you change your perspective then you will change your experience yep yeah and, and so uh, working out is drudgery i don't like doing it my perspective and because i don't like doing it i don't want to do it and this is stupid mm. now i'm going to experience the drudgery of going to the gym and working out but if my perspective is this will improve my health, oh, perfect example. If a year ago, if I had told you, <laughs> hey, Mike, go gluten free. It'll change your life. Yeah, a year ago, I would have said, excuse me. Yeah, that sounds like a pretty good idea. And then I'd have done nothing with it. And if your physician said, Mike, you have to change your diet. You have to go gluten-free or I am no longer going to see you as your physician. Boom. It's a doctor's order. You got to do it. He'll fire you if you don't. Would you have done it? I'd have probably tried it, but it, it wouldn't have worked. Yeah. It had been drudgery. It had yep. been work. It yep. had been complaining the whole time. Yep. Because your perspective at that time was one of this is silly this is stupid there's nothing to gluten this is a bunch of hogwash i love bread too much uh, i love pasta you're too taking much. away everything that i love in this world <laughs> i can't have all this stuff yep but you came to me last week and revealed a revelation in your life oh yeah gluten has been basically taking me out at the knees for a long time. I have, I have been without pain for the first time in my joints, just, just inflammation in my joints. I mean, it's been years. Mm -hmm. I'll wake up in the morning. I'll stand up out of bed. And I had for years just accepted that this was my lot in life. This is just what I have to deal with for the rest of my life. And I now stand up and I don't have any pain. I'm telling you. It, I'm a champion for gluten free, and I I don't know the answer to this question. That's the difference between a psychologist and an attorney. I ask questions I don't have the answer to. Mm -hmm. <laughs> How is your lower back? It's great. Now I remember I remember playing golf with you, mm -hmm. and you having to quit. Yep. Because the pain you were experiencing was so intense. Yep. I've played two rounds of golf in the last week and a half without any pain. It's it's I'm telling you I feel. So let me try to control the past a little bit. <laughs> I just feel foolish, but I'm so excited. I'm foolish for just a sec. I feel foolish for just a second. Then I quickly move on to how amazing it is right now. Right. And in the moment right now, I have no pain and it's incredible. And the, the reason this behavior change occurred and then stuck was because of your shift in your attitude. Yeah. Something inside of you said, let's give this a shot. Let's see what it's about. Yep. I'm open to uh, trying this and giving it a fair shot. Yep. That thought process, that attitude 
then allowed you to have a positive experience when the positive results were showing. Yeah. I wanted to give it a really honest and fair shake to really see because it doesn't happen overnight, but it didn't take long. I'm telling you, it was maybe a week, week and a half. And I felt, I really felt completely different. So I don't know if everybody will experience that. I don't know. But it can't hurt to try. Well, tell you what, I'm giving it a shot. Cool. You know, we had gone on that vacation and we noticed, uh, you know, by the second or third day even, we were feeling good. <laughs> yeah. We were waking up refreshed. We, we didn't, you know, feel compelled to have naps. A common experience for us older people <laughs> sure. is to have a big lunch and then be like, oh, I need a nap. Mm -hmm. Go lay down. Uh, none of that was going on. We walked 10, 15 miles a day, no pain. Uh, we, we slept well and, and we were kind of self analyzing. Why do we feel so good? And that's, we started looking at the foods we were eating at the resort and there was not a lot of breads or fibers or, uh, uh it, it was, you know, fresh meats, fresh fruits, fresh mm -hmm. vegetables, just a lot of clean food and that's when we realized that, you know, gut health. Oh, yeah. Gut health. And, and beyond gut health, the, uh, the bowels. The <laughs> Absolutely. And, and so uh, to, to explain to the, the listener who doesn't understand what we're talking about with gluten, gluten is a substance that's in a lot of wheats and flours and, and other product. And then the industry will take uh, a wheat and grind it down into something else and then use it say in ice cream to thicken it up yeah and so this this substance that was originally in just kind of like wheat rice and barleys this gluten now is infused in a lot of different foods and why some people have Hashimoto's disease or celiac disease or, or gluten sensitivities is the body is having an allergic reaction to the gluten and so imagine me with my, you know, horrible uh, allergies to ragweed and pollen. Yeah. And I step outside on one of those, you know, highly dangerous days where the, the green air, uh, just, you know, all the pollens in the air. And I begin to sneeze. My face swells a little bit. My eyes get puffy and red and tears start coming out of my eyes and snot's coming out of my nose. And I'm, I'm miserable in my face, in my head, that's an allergic reaction to a substance. Sure. Well, when our body has an allergic reaction to gluten, it's happening in our intestines. And, and, and intestines are very, very large. There's like nine feet of intestines inside you. Yeah. And so when these things become inflamed, you feel horrible, you feel bloated, diarrhea, constipation. It's just a miserable experience. But because you're having that allergic reaction, the body ramps up the defense mechanisms yeah. to attack. And so your immune system comes online and, and just overreacts to what's going on with the allergic reaction. And so that's where the inflammation starts to come in as your body's trying to attack the foreign substance and trying to heal whatever damage it senses is being done and and your joints start to hurt your your neck your lower back you, you get all this inflammation yep and here we are you know suffering so so this, this is about really funny we eat something that causes inflammation and then we go take <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and non-steroidal anti-inflammation and NSAID yep. to relieve the pain we got a battle going on. We cause the inflation, then we take a pill to reduce the inflation. Right. Yeah, and that, for me, it was a whole other level because I have uh, rheumatoid arthritis. So in an attempt for, you know, doctors to get that under control, they're, they're prescribing me medications to take. And I'm, I'm telling you, they have, the, the medication has, has helped but the biggest difference maker has been getting rid of the gluten. As you were talking there, I'm, I'm thinking to myself, yeah, you know what? I, I used to get up four to 
maybe a little TMI, but I don't care. <laughs> Four to five times a night to go to the bathroom. Right. I really have a hard time staying asleep and going to the bathroom, except in the bed. No. Uh, <laughs> you're, you're up. Right. You're awake. And so that was causing the beginning of a bad day because they're not getting enough sleep. And as I was, you know, I guess I can't 100% say that this is all connected, but I had allergies going on big time because we just went through the season. You just entered into it when all the Bradford pears were blooming and everything was flying around. I had allergies kicking my butt big time. I did this gluten-free stuff and I don't have one bit of allergy going on uh, today. I just, it's it's so crazy. This is going to be the Gluten Haters Club. <laughs> I'm telling you, it'll make a difference. Yeah. Give it a shot. See what's happening here? When he changed his ways, when he changed how he thought about diet, exercise, nutrition, what he's putting into his body, when he rethought all of that, then new behaviors became possible. New behaviors came to the forefront. I, and I, you know, when I dealt with the court systems for many years and, and families going through the conflict of divorce and child custody and, and co-parenting, mm -hmm. I had a number of cases where one parent thought the child had a gluten allergy or gluten sensitivity. And so they wanted to feed the child a gluten free diet mm -hmm. for the child's health. Whereas the other parent did not believe there was a gluten sensitivity that the other parent was just being dramatic. And and this would cause conflict between the parents to the degree that it would land them back in court. Wow. And then I would have to investigate what was going on with the family, with the child, to then advise the court about what to do in sure. relation to the child's potential for gluten sensitivity or not. And so I did a lot of medical research and spoke to a lot of physicians about the topic. Okay. And even, you know, with <laughs> this weird word coming out of my mouth. Even with an expert coming to a, a person and saying, this is the science of it, this is what your doctors have said, this is what the, the allergy tests show, this is how your, your son responds when he's fed gluten, this is how he responds when he's not fed gluten, the other parent refused to believe it. Wow. And so how they thought led to frustration, anger, irritation, uh, annoyance, uh, feeling like everybody's beating them up, everybody. You know. And so if you think that way and feel that way, what are you going to do? Yep. And so you're not going to value the idea of a gluten-free diet, right. even for your child. And in some cases, out of spite, Oh yeah. they would feed the child pizza. Hmm. Pizza may not have been on the menu that night, but if they went to court that day and the court said no more gluten, they'd take them to pizza that night mm -hmm. to prove everybody wrong. Right. And then the child becomes inflamed and mm. is miserable. And so, you know, we're talking in the introduction here about the power of how we think and the importance of changing how we think and how changing how we think not only changes how we experience things see things you know, my eyes were open to a whole new way of worshiping when I realized that if I thought of the music differently sure. I could then have a, a deeper more spiritual experience draw in closer to God by the music that I've always listened to you know that change in perspective changed my emotional experiences and and changed my behavior and now Tish and I go to all these Christian rock concerts all over the state mm -hmm. because of the power of the music and the words, and it becomes this, you know, remarkable experience. You walk on cloud nine when you walk out. You know, before that kind of revelation with the ACDC stuff, you know, music wasn't that big a deal to me. Right. And here is another example of changing how you think led to you changing what you do and those two things completely changed your, not just your emotional experience, but your physical experience. And here you are today, you know, excited, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> the recovering alcoholic, Hey guys, you know, check this out. 
uh, the, the newly non-smoker, the, right. the freshly baptized Christian running around yep. shouting joy yep. over gluten. Yeah. All because of a switch in how I was thinking. Yeah. And so over the next um, number of weeks, we're, we're going to walk through these chapters and talk about, you know, how do we reframe our thoughts? What is this cognitive reframing about? How does it work? Why yeah. is it important? And then we'll introduce these four specific ways, four very specific filters that we load into our brain that cause us to have certain experiences. But what we're going to do is learn to identify those filters yep, so that we can see them when we're thinking a certain way that gives us power to then choose a different filter or to choose a different way to think so that we can choose to have the experiences we want to have in a particular moment. Yeah, absolutely. And in this, this is the, the power to change your world. It really is your relationships, your peace. And it all comes from scripture, really not you. No scripture. You just repeated it and put it into terms that, that we can connect with and, and really sink our teeth into. Uh, but it all comes from the good old scripture. And that's my, my hope. And, and, you know, what used to be seen as a weakness, I now see as a strength and it took me a while to get there, but you know, going through graduate school and the early parts of my psychology career, I was very insecure about my intellect and my uh, ability to write, mm. uh, you know, reports and evaluations. And because I would read other psychologists work and they're just so intelligently written with such, you know, beautiful language and, and big words, <laughs> you know, that, oh, wow, I forgot about that word. It's, yeah. a, you know, psychoanalysis. I, that's what, but what I had to do in graduate school to be able to kind of understand what was going on was I had to learn their language with these big words and then define all those words down into a language I understood. Yeah. Translate it into a language that we understand. I had to translate it from academia to yeah. redneck. Yep. Hit then on. I could understand it. Yeah. And for a while I could translate it back so that the professor saw what they were wanting to see right. to pass me along. And as I'm writing reports for the court and for other psychologists, I just felt so insecure about what I was writing because it was not as excellent as the academic work. But over the years, what I began to realize was that's actually a strength. Absolutely. Because I have had, and still to this day, I will have attorneys who will be working a case and they will have some work by a psychologist and they will hire me mm -hmm. to read what that other psychologist wrote yeah. and then explain it to them in a language they can understand. Yep. And that's what I attempted to do with this book was take some pretty hefty, um, you know, concepts. Right. And, change them into a language that I think most people can read and understand and then go back and point you into the Bible where these are the concepts that he is talking about or Paul is talking about that line up mirror these psychological principles, changing how you think to empower you. Yep. This is the way. Yeah. Maybe one that we can hit on uh, next time is, is, and you use it as an example in here as well, is the whole um, speck of dust in your brother's eye and the plank in your own. Mm -hmm. And uh, exactly what it is that, that we control in that situation. So, yeah, it's good. So for the listener out there, for the, the person watching on video, um, we're going to walk through this book over the next number of, say, however many it takes, eight, nine uh, podcast eight nine videos so if you're tuning in uh, for the first time know that this next kind of segment is a eight or nine uh, series that that all connects together and 
Um, obviously, if you're listening right now, it doesn't matter. But in order to understand what we're talking about in video number four, you will have to have started in video number one. Because right. this stuff builds each week. That's right. On what we talked about the week before. Tell them real quick how to get the book. What's the best way to get the book? The book is 12 to How to Transform Your Mind, written by R. Lenz Parker. You can go on Amazon and type in the words 12 to Lance Parker, and it'll pull it up. Um, you can stop by my office, uh, 8629 West Central. I have some for sale there. On Amazon, I think it's fifteen ninety nine, fourteen ninety nine plus tax. Mm -hmm. At my office, it's just a flat twenty bucks. You can go to my website, theparkergroupinc.com. Scroll down, read more about the book, and on that page, there's a link. So if you're a Barnes and Noble member or a Books a Million member, there's a link to all the different bookstores that are selling the book. So you can just click on it, and it'll take you right to that page. Now. Uh, this is time sensitive information right now, but Mike is starting a, a, a Bible study in a week or two. May 2nd. May 2nd. And for people who are participating in Mike's Bible study, um, you swing by my office, the book is 10 bucks. And you just step in, you don't even have to talk to me. Just step in, grab a book, throw 10 bucks in the little silver can there. And we're good to go mm -hmm. um, because he wants you to have this book as he goes through the class. He's going to be using it in conjunction with the Bible study. Yeah, it absolutely helps with perspective again and how to get the most out of Scripture and know what God wants us to do with it and yeah. experience from it. Yeah, and I, these these are fundamentals. Uh, I'm giving a, a seminar to a, a state conference uh, here soon. And the topics I'm talking about in the conference are 100% built on these fundamentals. Mm, cool. Now, the higher end stuff we're going to be talking about it sounds different, but every single one of them is drawn right out of these four fundamentals to be able to do the higher order stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Good stuff. All right. Well, thank you guys for tuning in and hanging all the way through. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm Lance. And I'm Mike. And we're just these guys, you know. Have an awesome week. See you next week on the channel. <laughs>